So the, now the next talk is uh, demystifying few macular mysteries with uh, multimodal imaging by Dr. Unnikrishnan, who is the managing director of Chaitanya Group of Institutions. Okay. So thank you for the invite, Shane. So I'm just going to keep this uh, talk extremely light and partially non-relevant also, but yeah. So retinal imaging, uh, sometimes we believe certain factors and features and we believe certain truths, but sometimes you get popped up with a lot of surprises. So this is just a fun collection of things. So we just start looking at some macular holes. So sometimes when you say the macular ho hole closed, you have to eat your own words because uh, they don't uh, behave like you want to. This is a macular hole with a VMT attachment and uh, we were offering uh, surgery for the patient. The patient didn't have surgery. Subsequently, the patient developed a CNVR. And without surgery itself, the macular hole uh, closed because of the fibrotic reaction that happened. After some time, this patient uh, had a bleed. The bleed went through the macular hole and the, VMT, the uh, vitreomacular traction got relieved. So spontaneously, when you tell a patient that you have to do surgery, things like this can happen in your practice. I had a pediatric surgeon who, uh, who knew everything more about macular holes than I did. So we did a, mac a macular hole surgery for him. He started with 660. I told him, you will not have uh, an improvement in vision. So this was post-operative. It looked uh, very nice. And after some time, you can see uh, there was a small area of foveal atrophy happening. At this point of time, his vision had improved to 636. After a couple of months, his, the his RP atrophy increased, and now his vision is 612. And this is after about a year. There's a huge area of macular uh, RP atrophy, and he has got a 66 vision at present. So sometimes you have very lucky things happening, and uh, because he's a pediatric surgeon, he probably uh, thanked me without me doing anything. We had another patient, uh, and sometimes you just do a macular hole surgery, and you pray that it closes. So I prayed very hard for this patient. This patient had a macular hole and the macular hole closed, but after a couple of months, it started happening. It started closing too well. We had content inside and it started sprouting out. So uh, after a couple of, so this is a gliotic reaction and could, for lack of a better word, we can call it a retinal keloid. Can we call it a retinal keloid? So this is what happened for this particular patient. There are many, many theories of macular hole closure. That is, you relieve the tangential traction, uh, re remove the pull, um, there's a Muller cell. But one of the most fascinating is the astronaut inside the eye. And I call this the astronaut. It's like a man holding the two edges of the macular hole together. So this is the ILM flap, which causes a, a closure. So uh, Shira is looking. She is the one who worked up this case patient for me. And we called it the astronaut closing the macular hole. Membranes. So you have uh, different looking membranes. So this particular picture is very interesting. It's a very sh uh, subtle membrane. And uh, I was looking at the net, and I found that it exactly looks like the war memorial in Japan, the Iwo Jima war memorial. Uh, it's called, uh, this war memorial is for the World War II pi uh, pilots in uh, Japan. And then you have the mess. This looks like an ERM, but trust me, this patient cannot be touched surgically. This is a case of a combined hematoma. It looks like it. Uh, Vitreoretinal surgeons have itching hands because they want to try peeling this. Uh, along with the ERM, you will peel the retina, 50% uh, of the retina also if you touch this patient probably. So this is a combined hematoma. So let's go to the next section. This is called the flight of the headless chicken. So this is a particular patient in which this is a very short duration. Uh, so there was a cystoid, it's a, a, a diagnosis, a DME type lesion. And then they had this thing and inside, if you look at it, this is the headless chicken appearance I was talking about. There's a small uh, circle inside the cyst which looks like fibrin and there's an outline. And this particular patient, when we did the rest, we found another diagnosis. This is a patient with PAM. And you can see the ferning inside the, uh, the, ferning inside the uh, NFAS imaging. And you can see on these two sides of the, the middle layers are uh, hyperreflective. This is uh, an angiography which was done for this patient. And there are a few very interesting uh, findings that we found out in this. One being that there was a very pulsatile looking uh, lesion happening, pulsating throughout. So uh, this particular patient with an ischemic retina with a pulsatile lesion over here, and suddenly multimodal imaging causes more confusion. And this was a diagnosis we had actually made of uh, something like a PVAC, uh, a PVAC that is a, a peripheral exudative vascular abnormalness complex, big names. 
but an exudative component, uh, an ischemic component, all happening for this patient. Another patient which is quite interesting is that we had a look at one eye and made a diagnosis of a choroidal osteoma. Uh, it looked, uh, some of the features looked like that. On uh, the right eye, you can see it developed a CNV, and the left eye was relatively okay. This is how the picture looked. Uh, we, uh, on uh, autofluorescence, um, it's a, now looking back, it's a pretty typical diagnosis, but we'll go to, come to that later. So the OCT, uh, the ICG, the FFA, all yielded an intense amount of staining at that area, uh, lack of RP, and then you have uh, CNVM. So when we started treating the CNVM, something happened. That is the time between the injections, the size of the CNVM started increasing rapidly with many, many folds of uh, tissue. And this is what happened over time. And then it started, one day the RP just broke on top of it and there was a huge cystoid Michael edema. And you can see the thickness and then we saw a slight lesion and it looked like a haversian canal and we thought this was a choroidal ostomia. We did all the investigations outside the eye, we couldn't find calcification. Uh, it was an enlarged uh, blind spot and the ERG showed a, a scotopic uh, defect. And finally, when we looked back at it, it looked like an azure-type complex. And if you look at the uh, autofluorescence early, there was a trizonal appearance. Uh, the presence of a CNVM in azure, there are only two or three reported cases. So it's quite interesting how this patient unfolded. The area I've shown is a new area of CNVM developing, and the vessel started increasing in size. Just to bring a few angiographic uh, uh, pictures and uh, interesting things, so this is This is a picture where you can see uh, there's a pulsatile, the whole uh, posterior pole, there's a pulsatile area and the pulsatile of the hyperreflective, uh, what do you say, hyperpermeable uh, area. There's some, skip this, some, sorry. This is an interesting patient which has, you can, I mean, just, just for the interest of the dynamic angiography, he has got a severe amount of ischemia and you can see this small vessel pushing, 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 trying to push blood into the, uh, this is the circulation. So please look at this vessel. It's been trying for about a couple of 30 seconds, trying to push blood into the rest of the, uh, the circulation. And you can see slowly the blood column increasing. And this is the beauty of uh, dynamic uh, angiography and imaging. Now you can see it's slowly increasing uh, to increase the circulation to the rest of the areas. So, and this is a phenomenally amazing patient in which uh, I just wanted to see what happens in this patient. Uh, you can see what we have learned, the arteries fill first, the veins fill second. Here the arteries fill, the veins fill, the veins empty, and the uh, veins fill again. So there's a, it's like a spasm happened in between. You can just look at the veins. Suddenly you see the veins are filling, and after some time the whole circulation blanks once, and then it comes back. So the, on examination for this, you can see it blanking now, and it's coming back. On, uh, on evaluation, uh, we found a diagnosis of uh, vasospastic spinor. This was a Raynaud's with SLE type uh, patient, uh, Raynaud's retinal vasospasm. So this particular patient is quite interesting. Uh, why? Because this was what the angiography looked like. There's a lot of leakage on angiography in the posterior pole, but the, uh, the ICG doesn't show any problems, which ruled out a, uh, an inflammatory disease. But there is absolutely no leakage on the OCT. So you have leakage on the uh, fluorescent, but no leakage on the OCT. This is quite stunning. I've, uh, Dr. Parvinson also helped me with this patient. And this is what we found out. The patient had NVI. There was no radial pulse, had three MIs, and a history of Raynaud's. This was a Takayasu arthritis uh, with an ophthalmic, slow ophthalmic artery uh, occlusion happening in this patient. And one of the last patients I'd like to show you is this particular patient with uh, macular telangiectasia. You can see a vessel on the surface. And when you did uh, an FFA for this patient, this patient had uh, PDR. So it's a very interesting patient uh, of a, a case of a new concept of epiretinal neovascularization in MACTEL, where the retinal circulation grows into the and attaches to the macular telangiectasic vessels. So this is a very interesting patient which had uh, an ischemia which connected to the macular telangiectasia. So spectacularly man-made lesions. Okay, so you can see these, you can see these small dots which were carefully installed there during PFCL injection of this patient. Through the macular hole it went inside, sat over there. So these are beautiful man-made circular lesions, not PEDs. 
And uh, these are some of the lesions you can see in the color photo. You don't see anything but the multicolor. You see something. This is a choroidal uh, nevus happening. You see this beautiful picture of a pigmented lesion. This is picture is courtesy of Dr. Manoj. But sometimes when you use other modalities, it disappears in a multicolor. So be careful of multimodal imaging sometimes. It doesn't give you uh, what you expect sometimes. So thank you for the uh, listening. Hope you enjoy the talk. Thank you, Dr. Unni, for elevating the mood to the next level. <laughs> it's a beautiful uh, images, though. Uh, due to lack of time, we don't uh, need to discuss it.